Welcome back to The Couple. Today I'm joined by a man who needs no, int no introduction, uh, Mark Nelson of the Radiant Energy Fund, who, of course, is very well educated, holds degrees in uh, a number of engineering specialties, and is a uh, consultant and analyst to nonprofits and the nuclear industry. Mark, great to have you back. Good to be back, Chris. And I'm back here with you in a very appropriate place for today's topic. I'm here in the land of fracked gas, and I can hear my dad wincing in the background as I say that. He's a, he's a fracked gas man himself. And uh, I'm here in Oklahoma City, and that's a place where a number of the most innovative companies in the world are located that develop this incredible fossil fuel boom, both in oil and gas, that has flipped, flipped a lot of narratives on their head over the last uh, 10, 15 years in the U.S., and we've, we've got a lot to talk about. Um, for those of you who hadn't guessed, the topic today is natural gas. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about it recently, um, looking back at the uh, bright days of the nuclear renaissance in the early 2000s, looking at the factors that, that snuffed that out. But I think one of them was the, uh, what do we call it, the, uh, the fracking revolution. Um, but, you know, also the reason I wanted to have the show, Mark, was um, looking at the, the skyrocketing prices that we're seeing in Europe and Asia um, and all of that in the context of this fatal trifecta energy transition. Um, again, most of my listeners are very aware of Meredith Angwin, but that concept of an over-reliance on intermittent renewables, uh, just-in-time natural gas and imports. So um, natural gas is a very, I think, a kind of nebulous topic. Um it's, uh, it's a, it's a nebulous it's, fuel, Chris. Exactly, right? I mean, I, I chose the word, uh, I think, uh, on purpose there. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to visualize. When we think about gasoline or coal, like we've all pumped gas. We have a sense of those kind of volumes. You can kind of think of what a ton of coal looks like. Um, so I'm relying on you, Mark, to, uh, to help us understand a lot of this um, and, and get our heads around it. Um, so yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure where to begin. I, we have some right, background to get to, but I'd about, certainly like to... Let's begin with just what natural gas is. Natural gas Shoot. is uh, formed in the earth from decaying organic matter under heat and pressure. It is primarily methane, the simplest hydrocarbon, CH4. Uh, more than 90% of most natural gas uh, supplies found in the world are methane. And then there's a little bit of other hydrocarbons, the heavier hydrocarbons like ethanes and some... Uh, uh, butane and maybe um, uh, even heavier fractions. The, the, the more carbon molecule or the more carbon atoms there are in a molecule of a hydrocarbon, the heavier it is. And, it, and you go from the colorless, odorless uh, natural gas main constituent methane all the way to thick, sticky tar based on whether you have one carbon in the hydrocarbon up to hundreds of carbons right. in the hydrocarbon, right? So there's this continuum, and all of it's coming out of the earth from different ages and different original uh, sources of organic matter under heat and pressure. And natural gas mm -hmm. is a thing that for a very long time was a waste product only, and that is because gases are hard to handle. Gases have been hard right. to handle. I mean, if one of the things that marks out modern society, I would say, is an ability to handle pressurized substances. So, I mean, a lot right. of the big scientific breakthroughs of the Renaissance were being able to handle pressure. In the old days, to have uh, something that could hold in pressure was very difficult. And natural, natural right. things would be used like, talking you know, the bladder of a pig or whatever, or um, goat skins right. or whatever. Those could handle pressures, and these pressures were typically coming into uh, use during fermentation processes, so the formation of right. gases from bacterial action on foodstuffs, for example. Anyway, I hadn't, I hadn't you, thought about it that way, but I mean, it's the, the steam engines what unlocked the industrial revolution in the last three hundred years of that sort of skyrocketing in, in human progress, and that's all about containing pressure, right? My, my son's right. obsessed with with steam locomotives right now, so that that's ringing true for me. So you you see that we're in in the in the steam age, you had a really tight feedback loop between a desire for more efficiency, blowing up your device and killing the inventor, friends, users, customers, right, and then 
right. circling back around to having higher pressures at safer operating conditions. And you just went back and forth like a braid. Higher pressures, right. bigger booms, better pressurization, um, just forward, 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 until you suddenly had machines operating with internal pressures hundreds of times atmosphere where only only a few centuries before only the tiniest pressure gradient was able to be created in any man-made uh, situation. Hot air balloons have a mm. tiny pressure gradient. There's a tiny difference in air pressure between inside and outside of the balloon and yet with the hot gas even with that tiny pressure difference there was enough. Uh, there was enough buoyancy to lift people high enough into the air to kill themselves. Why we're talking about this with natural gas is because natural gas is a very strange fuel because it messes up a number of the narratives that are otherwise quite useful to us, like the energy ladder or the energy density narrative. Where, if we're right. going towards energy dense fuels, how is natural gas taking over? And so, how did natural gas snuff out? the second nuclear renaissance, right, in the U.S., right. if it's going backwards in energy density. And the truth is that once you build a pressurized pipeline network and you, ex you pay untold billions, tens of billions to, to spread pipeline networks around, you overcome that factor that made natural gas a waste product for much of the history of the oil industry. The fact that oil... Mm -hmm is valuable, it's so dense that it's valuable when put into barrels, for example, although that's mostly just a unit of measurement, there aren't actual barrels sitting around. But right. a, a relatively low diameter pipeline of oil transmits an immense economic value of material. That is not quite true for natural gas. You need to pressurize a natural gas pipeline. You need to create that natural gas pipeline, gotcha. and then you need to maintain it so that it doesn't blow up and kill large numbers of people and destroy your expensive equipment. All of these factors about natural gas made it kind of a Johnny-come-lately on the world energy scene. Honestly, even later than nuclear. Natural gas as right. a global fuel is coming later than nuclear as a global fuel. I, I uh, don't have the exact statistics in front of me, but Václav Smil uh, has talked about that in, in one of his great books on energy transitions. And I think some of the original sort of compressing technology that made natural gas feasible dates back to I think the 1880s, 1890s. And, you know, he was commenting that, you know, compared to coal, which took relatively shorter periods of time um, to become a dominant fuel source, we're still only at about 20% natural gas and we're 100 and something years later, maybe 120, 130 years later. So that I think that speaks to it, the challenge of using this fuel and why also developing countries tend to go coal first and then are, you know, move into natural gas later. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, one weird way to look at it, and we're, it's a little bit of a strange comparison, is that the amount of money invested in natural gas pipelines since the start of the fracking boom about 15 or so years ago is pretty close to the inflated dollar value spent on building out the French nuclear fleet. In the, mm -hmm. in the 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, that like somewhere under or in the range of $100 billion, USD, 2021 dollars, right. that's on the order of the amount spent by the French to build. Now, France is a smaller country than um, America, but also natural gas pipelines are not themselves energy. They are not energy, either production or consumption, they're just the middleman, just to get right. just to get the what's going to be power, what's going to be heat from one place to another. So this density thing gets even stranger when we talk about the way that natural gas becomes an energy dense fuel and can be shipped afterwards in some of the ways that oil can. That's liquefied mm -hmm. natural gas. Right. Methane, at least. Methane is the number one uh, constituent component of natural gas. Methane turns into a liquid at about, I think it's about 260 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. For the metric users, um, that's really uh, low. It's just somewhere way low down there, right? For everyone else in who's not American. But America is the number one gas producer. So in this episode, Chris, you'll oblige me oh. if we use American units. All right? Yeah, that's what I thought. We'll get something in the show notes. We'll get something in the show right. notes because we're only about 35% downloaded in the States. Uh, but anyway, 
the rest of the world civilized. So America is now the number one natural gas producer in the world. We're also the number one user, so we better be producing. However, we actually produce more than we can use most of the time, which is why there's a bunch of liquefied natural gas terminals now being built and operated, mostly in the path of the hurricane that's about to hit uh, the U.S. here in about what, two yeah. days. Yeah. Anyway, so these liquefied natural gas terminals are construction projects that are of the expense and complexity of giant nuclear plants. Again, demonstrating that as long as the politics are not brought into it that come with radiation, we can still build in America. Hmm. There's an ethane cracking plant being built up in Pennsylvania. Ethane, that's one of the molecules that I said was the next biggest component of natural gas typically other than methane. It's got a lower freezing temperature. It's got a uh, higher boiling point, I'm pretty sure. It's got more carbon in it than methane sure. does. So at an ethane cracking plant, you take in stuff like natural gas and you, you then create the beautiful world of plastics we have around us by processing those molecules, sticking them together into bigger chunks, turning them into different substances by the addition of other, other atoms into more complex molecules. Anyway, at this big ethane cracking plant that's being constructed up in Pennsylvania, we're talking tens of billions invested. We're talking pressure vessels that put the largest pressure vessels used by, by um, nuclear to shame. We're talking about an operation of the scale of a giant nuclear power plant project like Baraka and UAE is just nobody knows about it and we don't hear about it because it's just simply in the hydrocarbon sector. Now you'd think that it's, we'd hear about yeah. something like that because everyone, all our elites are so worried about climate change and it's going to kill us, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not even saying they're wrong. I'm just saying if we are that concerned, you think we would hear, hear more about those big projects and that maybe somebody would protest them or try to stop them or whatever. But that seems to be reserved for pipelines specifically, typically oil, and for nuclear projects. Those are the things you protest and stop. Um, not, mm. the, not the LNG facilities or the ethane cracking plants or whatever. Right. So, I mean, so no, natural none gas of this, is, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, go, go on, Chris. No, no. So you were just talking about sort of multiple uses, right, for, as a feedstock for, for plastics, um, for electricity, obviously, and then also for, for heating. And that's where some of the issue kind of comes in um, during crises like like Texas when or, or you know, what Meredith Angwin describes in uh, in the Northeast, where decisions need to be made about heating homes or producing electricity. Right. So how did we get to the point where our reliance on natural gas is increasing, even as uh, most of our media talks about decarbonization? Well, for yes. one, the fracking boom happened. So what is this fracking boom? First, um, I would be probably kicked out of my family home if I didn't mention that you should spell fracking without the K. F-R-A-C-I-N-G. Why? Because that's the way it's done in the oil and gas biz. If you want to be legit, you spell fracking without the K. It looks like phrasing, but they don't care. It's fracking. Frac fracking or f hydraulic fracturing is when you take an area of rock you know it has gas in it. It's always had gas. It's shale. It's very thin layers, almost like a, you know, like a, a phyllo pastry, like a baklava, right? So extremely mm -hmm. thin layers with gas trapped in between the thin layers. All hydrocarbon uh, recovery in the world is from oil and gas soaked rock that you penetrate. You let the pressure of the earth push the oil and gas into the hole that you've drilled and then it comes out the top. When the earth has less to give and it takes more pressure, sometimes you put a vacuum pump and you suck it out like a, the proverbial melt shake from a fairly traumatic scene from the great movie There Will Be Blood. You suck the milkshake of the oil and gas reservoir out. So what do you do right. if you find shale where you have very thin layers in the earth from, say, floodplains or rivers that put down layer after layer of silt and mud with organic matter sandwiched in between um, that over time turned into gas, but it remains trapped in the shale. Because if you just drilled down and you just drill right to it, you would collect a tiny bit of gas from a tiny little area, then you go bankrupt. So what the fracking revolution was is to say you combine directional drilling, which is you drill down and you, you 
drill into the formation through a thin formation that waves and, and moves through the earth. You get a bigger, bigger line drilled through that formation. That's the first step. Second, you blow holes in the pipeline to, to allow, to allow uh, fluid to flow in and out from a lot more places on the pipeline. Then you pump at very high pressures of fluid into the formation where it goes in through the layers where the gas is that you want. And the fluid that you put right. in, you put in little bitty particles that open, like opening, the, like wedging open the phyllo pastry in a baklava. Don't, don't dissect your dessert at home to do this. It's a very tasty dessert. Just to eat it. But you're, you're sort of spacing apart these tiny thin layers. And then the fluid's got these little pebbles in it, and it keeps the layers open. And then when you withdraw the fluid... The little, the little particles keep the layers open, and the gas begins to flow over a massive surface area. Right. That is a lot of complicated things that had to go right all at once. It was crazy mofos that decided they could make that work. It ended up working. It works for both gas and oil recovery, and it turned an immense amount of shale. Like The oil men have always known there's been so much shale over under so much of the of the continental US, right? They just couldn't mm -hmm. couldn't economically produce much gas and oil from it. Now they can. That released an incredible quantity of oil and gas. Now most gas production, more than half gas production in the US is from this non-traditional fracked gas plays and a bunch of oil is so-called tight oil, same thing. Right. Um and it turned America from a deficit of natural gas and oil to a surplus, and we are now the number one oil and gas producing country on earth. Wow. Am I, so we were talking about the energy density of, of natural gas. Um, I think one feature of, of modern sort of fossil fuel extraction is that the extraction is also quite dense, right? And we don't tend to see a lot of the infrastructure of that extraction because it's often an offshore rig or, um, you know, the wells are fairly small. And, and I think one of the reasons that fracking has become so political beyond, you know, fears about groundwater and, and everything else is that all of a sudden there's little rigs all over the place in Pennsylvania in people's backyards. Is that is that true that the infrastructure is more diffuse, more visible in the same way that there's wind turbines everywhere, that there's, you know, these little um, derricks being set up all over the place? Or am I, am I off base on that? In the end... If you're getting your, your oil and gas from a, a really thin layer, it means you have to cover a much more layer with whatever equipment is required for production. Um, right. It's also a product of a social media environment where any given thing that sounds or, or appears attractive to a viewer, even if attractive because it's a bad thing, can spread really rapidly. And then finally, a bunch of people um, see any risk taken that also leads to more carbon in the air as just one too many things that are bad and then there's there's an, a public attack on it. Here's another thing. Mm -hmm. um, in Oklahoma, at least, the increased oil and gas production led to waste fluids, muds, waters, uh, salt water, various things pumped out of the earth that needed to be pumped back in. When those were pumped back in at large volumes to old disused wells, it lubricated a bunch of extremely ancient fault lines and there was a there was an earthquake storm in Oklahoma for many years that would mm. definitely do it you know in Oklahoma we're used to the site of pumping units famously at a few miles from here at the state capitol building in downtown Oklahoma City there is right there in the view of the state capitol building an operating oil there or uh, a pumping unit you know one of these big things that goes like this Mm -hmm. And it just puts mm -hmm. a slight, as we learned already in this episode, puts a slight vacuum on the well and sucks out the, the oil a little bit. Interesting. For people so not Mark, used to those, for people where oil and gas had not been produced heavily for, you know, 80 years, 90 years, several generations, the rapid influx of new people, new materials, combined with maybe an insufficient payoff to the locals, they did not enough left money left to pay off everybody just led to people feeling they were taking on risks without the reward which by the way is going to be a universal issue whether you're trying to build solar panels wind turbines or nuclear plants that's mm -hmm. where energy density comes back in 
where if you have to do an immense amount of building, you spread out a lot of downsides or perceived downsides for a lot of people, are you providing upsides that make it worth it for them? In the fracking revolution, for a lot of people, the answer was no. Mm -hmm. So we just talked about some of the elements of production. Um, one of the um, controversies around around natural gas is the um, the climate benefit in terms of being lower carbon than uh, coal. Um, and that being contingent upon something called like the methane leak rate. And obviously that can occur at the site of production, that can occur along the pipelines, it can occur at you know, the, the appliance you know, where the furnace gets plugged in. Um, so tell us a little bit about that, um, about that controversy, what the leak rate is and how that contributes to the life cycle emissions calculations for natural gas. First, let me say one can do too much modeling and rely too much on sampled measurements. I think that the right way to look at it is from a carbon perspective. Coal versus gas is approximately a wash. I mean, because on one hand, coal beds give off methane too. I mean, sometimes it's harvested. Mm -hmm. The original gas for towns was coal cooked to produce methane that was then piped to towns to run lights. Like that's the original gas right. light era, right? Um, so coal can give off gas at the same time. Coal gives off other dangerous particulates that can hurt people. On the other hand, coal gives off much longer persistent good employment at the sites where coal is being produced, which is something that's not definitely clear from the natural gas, especially when you need so much acreage now um, to produce fracked gas. Here's another thing. The natural gas system may have values that look really good, and then a giant accident somewhere inverts the numbers after only one month, right? So let's say that your leak rate from all the natural gas for storage facilities is under control, it's not too bad, and people are writing scientific papers that say, no, actually the leak rate for natural gas is not so much, therefore natural gas is still better on a climate basis. Then you have one Aliso Canyon, one incident, like in Southern California, where a giant underground storage facility for natural gas, which is something we haven't talked about, but is key to making up for the energy density problem with natural gas. You have disused oil and gas fields where you run the system in reverse. You pump gas into the oil and gas field down in the, to the reservoir, right? And then you withdraw it when you need it later. So one of those giant facilities that powers Southern California, especially since Southern California eliminated nuclear, which would have compensated for the need for gas, started leaking. And it leaked, and it leaked, and it leaked, and it leaked a massive amount of CO2 all out, which means that if you were evaluating natural gas's climate advantage before the Aliso Canyon leak, you're going to say one thing. Then after the leak, right. you're going to say, well, except for the leak, except for that big giant leak that happened, right. natural gas is right. better. Right Now, it may be that average, if you average over enough of the world and there's enough storage facilities that don't blow, like Aliso Canyon, it does work out. But you see we're at the point where the decimal points, the sensitivities, the sophistication of modeling is a little bit less important than the fact that it's kind of a wash, depending on any given year, whether there's an accident with natural gas or whether it works out well. Right, right. Here's another thing. So, In liquefied natural gas, you use up 10 to 15% of the gas, turning it into a liquid. Why? Because you need to burn the natural gas to run the compressors and to, to keep the equipment in good working order to turn it into a liquid. Then you burn off a little wow. more of the, the gas as, the, as these giant ships, these huge ships. Um, and we can talk about how much energy is in a ship. How many giant liquidified natural gas container ships does it take to replace a nuclear plant? There's an interesting question for developing countries, right? These big ships then travel the world's oceans, waiting for highest bidders or being pre-contracted in some cases, and they burn off a little bit of the gas on their way. Then when the gas hits landfall, it gets turned back into a gas. And the, if you're wanting for an answer to the, if you're wanting an answer to this mystery about is LNG advancing towards or away from energy density, at the point that you turn it into a liquid, you increase its energy density by a factor of 600 or more, right? So once you convert it to a 600 times more dense substance, then you have on the order of the same energy density as oil.
Right. It right. just took a lot more effort, a lot more expense to get it into that form and to ship it around the world. The world's okay, oceans so- today are being are being uh, prowled by 650, approximately 650 LNG tankers. Mm-hmm. Each tanker, a giant tanker that has about 125,000 cubic meters of liquid gas, that turns into, well, 600 times that amount of, of uh, gas at standard temperature and pressure. That ends up being able to run a natural gas power plant, if that's what it's used for, to produce about 0.5 terawatt hours of uh, electricity, if you run it in a modern combined cycle plant with about 7,000 BTUs per kilowatt hour. What does that mean right. in terms of nuclear replacement? And specifically, what would it mean if Germany were trying to use LNG tankers instead of a giant pipeline from Russia? Yes, yes, yeah. 0.5 terawatt hours is about 1 20th of the electricity produced from each of the nuclear reactors that is being shut down over the next 15 months if we can't stop the Germans from hurting themselves. So that one twentieth of the output of a single tankers, nuclear plant. Yes, twenty t- per year. Twenty tanker loads okay. per year of some of the largest ships in the world that look like these. It looks like a pot of peas. Five giant spheres on a single long boat passing through canals that never get blocked, like the Suez Canal. Um, and then they travel around. And if 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 Germany were using these ships instead of Nord Stream, it would take twenty of those cargo loads per year to replace the electricity from one nuclear reactor. Now, uh-huh. to really put it in perspective, why they've, they've sold out their future to a gas pipeline from Russia, it's this. That gas pipeline is 110 billion cubic meters of gas per year capacity. Two parts, 55 each. The new pipeline that has been so controversial, and people can listen to our old episode for my uh, take on that pipeline, each side is 55 billion cubic meters. One side's already there. Let's talk about the new side. 55 billion cubic meters is the equivalent, and in terms of electricity, of about approximately 250 terawatt hours of electricity if all of that gas were used to run uh, combined cycle natural gas turbines, okay? okay? That 250 terawatt hours, well, right off the bat, about 15 to 20% of that is nothing more than to replace those nuclear reactors in, in, in Germany. So Another 10, 15% would be to replace the nuclear reactors going off in, say, Belgium, if, we were, if all of it were for that purpose. In okay. reality, a lot of the gas is to replace gas that's not going to run from the other pipelines in Europe. In other words, Russia is running the gas straight to Germany to eliminate the military and economic importance of Eastern Europe to Germany and therefore to Mm -hmm. the EU. Now, some of these countries are in the EU. It's a little bit unfortunate, but that's why it's such a bad idea. So if you're wanting to ask whether natural gas is good for the climate, are we asking, are we asking, is that natural gas itself good because it doesn't leak? Or are we asking, is the natural gas replacing zero carbon nuclear or is it replacing ultra high carbon German coal. Cool. In this right. case, what appears to be the, happening is that first it's replacing gas pipelines from other countries, set, which would, it's a wash basically. Not a wash for those other countries, they're screwed, but it's a wash on the right. climate from Germany's perspective. Then, to the extent that the natural gas, a bunch of it, another 20, 30% straight off the bat of the new pipeline is just to replace nuclear plants, that's a huge loss. Then, if that gas replaces um, other supplies of gas for other nations in Europe, it's also a wash. I mean, mm-hmm. pipeline gas is going to be the going to be from a climate perspective cleaner than LNG because you don't lose the ten to fifteen percent liquefying it; just a very small percent right. in transit to pump, to run the pumps to keep it pressurized and to keep it flowing. Then there's a yeah. question of how clean on gas leaks are the fields in Russia that are producing this gas. We can speculate, it's probably not incredible, but I haven't been there, so I shouldn't slander our friends at Gazprom. They might be running a very good operation over in the Yomal fields in Siberia. So, where does that leave us with Europe? 
Where does that leave us with gas? Gas burns really clean, so it doesn't have the types of pollutants that coal does. It doesn't burn perfectly clean, especially on hot days, especially with all these emergency gas generators popping all the way up the coast of, of uh, California. Those are going to put some products like nitrous oxide into the air that do have local health issues. And when we had Meredith Anguin on, she, she's an expert in, in controlling pollution at fossil power plants amongst, uh, as, as a chemist. And she was mentioning that, you know, when you're having to ramp um, these plants up and down constantly, like if, if you can run a natural gas plant fairly continuously, you can inject a bit of water and you can really limit, I think, the amount of pollutants coming out of it. But when you're constantly ramping up and down to reply to, um, you know, the intermittency of renewables, that, that that's kind of a goes in addition to sort of that stop go traffic and loss of fuel efficiency are also having a much harder time controlling pollution. But I wanted to you know, on the topic of Europe um, and in terms of this podcast in general, uh, something that's really come to my attention is the incredible differences in, in price volatility, um, say, between um, America, where you're producing it in your backyard, you're shipping in a small um, distance by, by pipeline versus, say, Europe or Asia. Um, and in our, in our conversation before the uh, podcast, you were talking about this um, injection season and withdrawal season uh, season. And it really reminded me of, you know, just respiration, breathing in, breathing out. So as a way to sort of help us understand cycle. In, breathing in, breathing out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to help us understand yeah. uh, a little bit the basis for this price volatility, could you just like walk us through the sort of seasonal um, cycle of, of natural gas and, and why sure. Europe might be in a crunch this winter? Basically, energy producers want to produce constantly all the time. Industrial users want to use constantly all the time. And human needs are based on climate, the weather, our activities. Those are the things that are seasonal. How do you match the need to produce constantly with seasonal consumption? A lot of the space heating, a lot of heating air and water for human life in Europe is done on a seasonal basis because Europe is very far north. So in the summer, when, say, solar is producing a lot, it's when energy is least needed. And in the winter, when um, wind tends to come in, that would seem to be a good match. But the energy needs are very high for human life, for human comfort and life in the winter. That means the withdrawal from the natural gas system, and we'll go into the fact that that's both underground storage in Europe and the pipelines coming into Europe and the LNG coming into Europe, is going to be much higher in the winter. Europe has a working storage capacity of about, and it's about 3,000, or a bit over 3,000 billion cubic feet of natural gas. That ends up being, when you convert it to billion cubic meters, about the same amount of storage for all natural gas for all European countries as the new Nord Stream 1 and 2 super pipeline. Hmm. That's right. A single pipeline from Russia is going to have the exact same energy delivery capacity of all the storage of natural gas in all of Europe. That means if you have a year like this year and the natural gas people, the natural gas buyers and sellers, the people who take risks and try to make money by buying low and selling high, they were waiting for lower prices in order to start filling the natural gas storage needed for winter, those lower prices didn't come. They didn't store much for winter. There's a, uh, I mean, they still got a few weeks, Chris, to store some for winter, but this is a big ant in the grasshopper situation coming. There is not enough natural gas for a winter of any real cold severity, but there is Nord Stream 2 coming online. Mm, interesting. We should expect a very, very expensive natural gas winter. When those prices are high, things start getting weird. One of the things is, despite absolute record eye-bleeding prices for CO2 emission certificates in Europe, coal plants are still being chosen over natural gas in a lot of European countries. Coal plants because that are not receiving yeah. much in the way of new investment, that are hated, everybody wants them gone, all the leaders are running on lower carbon, and yet natural gas is so incredibly expensive that coal, with massive carbon penalties at, point of, at the point of burning, whatever the life cycle emissions, those coal plants are putting out about 
two to two and a half times more carbon per unit of energy, meaning the certificate, carbon certificate prices end up adding anywhere from, you know, from a really clean natural gas plant at today's European carbon prices. I, your users may ping me for this if I get the math wrong. Anywhere from 15 to $60 a megawatt hour USD from the carbon certificates alone, depending on really clean natural gas to pretty dirty coal. And despite mm-hmm. that massive, massive penalty, the coal is still outcompeting the gas in a lot of Europe. Why is that? Well, one of the most recent prices I've seen run across my radar is $20 a million BTU for natural gas delivery. I think that was an LNG cargo, okay, if you're buying on the spot market. What does that $20 a million BTU mean? Well, I'll tell you, when, trans- when translated into natural gas power plant electricity, $20 per million BTU is approximately $140 a megawatt hour not to pay your staff, not to pay off the cost of the plant, not to repair the thing, not to save up for bad times, none of that. That's $140 a megawatt hour just for the fuel alone at the point that you, you, get, you get the gas into your country's system. Now, just to remind your viewers, nuclear plant production costs in the world run from under $20 a megawatt hour for the absolute best in class plants in. I know I've heard that for Sweden and I've gotten on good authority that that's what the what the production costs are for the cheapest American plants, especially in Texas, right? Under right. $20 a megawatt hour for all your staff, all your taxes, all your repairs, all your fuel, everything, all in over the course of a year. A nuclear plant operating well, a modern one, two unit plant operating well is going to be under $20 a megawatt hour for everything of which $5 or less per megawatt hour is the fuel. Compare that to if you're paying these LNG prices at $20 a million BTU, that is $140 yeah. megawatt, uh, dollars per megawatt hour just for the fuel. 140 just for the fuel versus right. 20 all in for the cheapest nuclear plants. So all those people who spent decades attacking the, the Texas nuclear plants for being, you know, absolute white elephants, way too expensive, $10 billion to make, that advantage is eroded. The advantage between cheap natural gas plants that can pop up in two years and the, the, the really expensive, too long to build, controversial nuclear plant, that gets eroded really fast at $120 minimum difference in production costs. Now, Texas is obviously not seeing $140 meg- per megawatt hour for natural gas. Their natural gas is still booming. It's still kind of constrained and all the pipeline networks in Texas that as long as they don't freeze, do a good job of getting really cheap Texas gas to the market. If I judge based on the Henry Hub prices, which is a benchmark price for American natural gas based on a location um, in the in the southeast, I think it's in Louisiana, I should know this. This reveals me as a nuclear guy and not a nas- natty gas guy, Chris, but the Henry Hub prices are about $4 a million per million BTU. That's obviously a lot less than 20. That takes your 140 down by a factor of five to about, what is that, 30, uh, high 20s, right? So high 20s per megawatt hour just for the fuel. That means at the moment, natural gas plants are having to pay for fuel at a price that puts them above the average production price for all American nuclear. And is this This where deregulated... Sorry, I want to say deregulated this backwards yeah. into why the nuclear renaissance got killed. This $4 per million BTU, well, back when the nuclear renaissance was kicking off, we saw prices up at 10 occasionally. During the big commodity bubble, the housing crisis, the housing bubble, all that, the natural gas prices at the Henry Hub were sometimes up way above 10, which meant that if you were looking at the natural gas fuel alone, which is about 60 to 80% of the cost of all-in cost of a natural gas power plant solution as opposed to nuclear, about 60 to 80 percent of that cost is going to be your fuel costs. And if your fuel costs alone are up at 40, 50, 60 dollars a megawatt hour and you don't see any sign of reprieve, then it makes sense to take a risk on nuclear if the reactor vendors are saying we can do it for an all-in first 30 years cost of 40, 50, 60 dollars a megawatt hour, that starts to look really good, especially if anyone actually cares about climate change, which all you need to see is our elite environmental groups attacking nuclear to know they don't actually care about climate change. But if you thought in 2005 that they did, 
and you saw expensive natural gas and even more expensive in the future, you could see why it was, and you thought that you could build nuclear plants for 40, 50, or $60 a megawatt hour, uh, levelized yeah. cost of electricity, you can see why we thought the future was nuclear. It fell so apart despite, when that natural gas yeah. fuel price fell to $20 a megawatt hour, $15 right. a megawatt hour. Hell, hell, before this February Texas freeze, there were moments last year where natural gas had returned to being a waste product, even with pipelines, even with pipelines. People were being paid to burn it, to get it out Just of the Just to pipeline. flare it off at the well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that begs the question, if you have these very well operating nuclear plants that are cost competitive with the fuel costs, um, the role of deregulated markets, and we've looked at that in a fair amount of detail now on the podcast, but it seems like natural gas gets rewarded because it's such a flexible uh, generation source, and it can capture those uh, high value moments when electricity is priced quite high because there's demand peaks. Is that that's yep. part of why n- nuclear is also getting killed by gas? Let's generalize a little. We've had some really specific numbers. Let's generalize. Flexible fuel. You should hear when you hear flexible fuel, not having to plan, not needing to plan, and maybe not being able to plan. Chris, planning takes trust. And it takes faith, two things that I think are in extremely short supply in our planners and our elite people and our financial people. Trust and faith are in very short supply. It's just easier to say, to hell with it all, I'm going with gas. It may not mm-hmm. work, but it won't be my ass. Like that, that, would, that is practically, practically the motto of today's decision makers, a sort of cynical fatalism of I've got mine. I don't really care the state of things in the world when I die. I've got mine. Right. That's good enough. I think that that's a lot of the push um, for natural gas as opposed to really long-term thinking. Now, I'm not saying that, like LNG, to build an LNG program, you have to have incredibly long-term thinking, Chris. It's just right, right. you can have that where you don't have the interference from the groups whose only purpose is to stop nuclear at all costs. Now that there are people whose only purpose is to stop hydrocarbons at all costs, Things are breaking down a little bit um, and being able to do big projects there either, but they still don't have the same weight of history and the effectiveness of elite interference that nuclear does. So get, getting back to Europe for a second, you know, where we're seeing this, you know, real transition from nuclear towards natural gas, particularly in countries like Germany and Belgium, um, you know, where the house is being bet on this, where there's this very kind of schizophrenic energy policy at place. Um, this price spike again. I think I saw on the news a thousand percent for natural gas in Europe. Is that is that affecting at all the um, the uh, the decision making around this? Is there too much path dependency? Have 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 decisions been made already, or does this start to pose a challenge towards that that strategy towards again creating a fatal trifecta for for Europe and for the nuclear phase out? I, I mean, these, these thousand percent prices are not, they're not permanent, obviously. It's just there's a lot of volatility. But is that, is that getting through at all to decision makers? Is that getting through in the media at all, would you say? It's not getting through in the media. It may be getting through to the media uh, behind the scenes. It is getting through to policymakers, and there is some extremely strong and tantalizing evidence that it is hitting home and it's changing some fairly key decisions. I will know a lot more in a month. Let's talk about it in a month. I Things are still in flux so much that I don't want to be caught on video talking about it. I'm going to Germany in a few days. I'll be in Belgium after that. I'll be in Netherlands after that. I have lots of interesting conversations lined up. Get back to me in a month. I know it's affecting decision making. I really do. But I don't know whether it's going to end up with a better result for nuclear because of the, the so little time left. Mm-hmm. on nuclear phase outs in the key countries that matter on policy we'll see i do know i do know that in in the uk the price the uk government promised to the french and chinese governments for putting up the money to build the uk its nuclear next nuclear plant was considered so implausibly high that hinkley point c would be an absolute absolute scandalous waste of consumer resources because we would never see those electricity prices ever again. Electricity prices in Europe are so high. And remember, this isn't even the high time. This is not the high time of year for electricity prices in Europe. They're so high that the gas got burnt and did not get stored. They don't have enough going into the winter. 
We are going to have to pray at the beautiful cathedrals of Europe for a mild winter. We got to pray to the weather gods, Chris, for a mild winter, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, right now, electricity prices are already so high that should they stay anywhere near their current price, Hinkley Point C will be seen as an, a very far seeing, far reaching good decision for the UK. I know that other countries in Europe are going to see that. Just the question is whether they have, we, they have a public or even decision makers left with the, with the open mindedness to rethink nuclear. I think they do, or I wouldn't be involved in the stand up for nuclear movement, and neither would you, Chris. So right. let's go fight it. Let's make it so. I think we do need to communicate about the gas prices to make it clear that it's gas prices being high, which is hurting your wallet. And the only, the only thing you can do is either rapidly and <laughs> and uh, significantly expand natural gas production all over, including in Europe, including in New York, including in places that have banned it. Mm -hmm. And you have to be less dependent on it. That means keeping nuclear and adding more. I mean, the function of high prices in a, in a market is, is to drive up you know, investment so that there'll be more supply delivered, right? Which obviously conflicts yes, with climate goals. Yes, but now that the elites of Europe have said that carbon is bad and gas is bad, so therefore you shouldn't have it, there's this mixed messaging going on. Right. Where the big financial groups that answer to public authorities or to public pressure on climate are holding back and they're going to wait for what is happening in Belgium, where the government is coming to all the big parties and saying, no, it's good. All that talk about climate, it's just, we're just kidding. We need you to invest in natural gas right away, right away. We'll give you billions. We'll give you anything you want. We'll give you access to everything, fast permits. We'll give you anything you need to build out a natural gas infrastructure. That's what the Green Party is doing in Belgium, right? Until that happens in other countries, the mixed messaging will be extremely high prices for natural gas, Make my dad happy, um, but it won't lead to big public entities being able to invest. It will lead to big pots of money that do not answer to public sentiment being able to scoop up oil and gas assets, pipelines, uh, uh, distribution networks, um, wells, right? They'll be able to scoop those up for way below the price that today's sales prices suggest they should cost because a lot of public money all over the world is prevented from being invested in owning the energy sources that are now scarce enough that we're paying a lot for it. That was a really complicated I mean, sentence. I hope we can no, slow that no, down I and turn that into transcript. But you see the issue here. Those who don't care about no. climate can scoop up all the oil and gas. Those who do care about climate are desperately using the oil and gas while harming the competitors to oil and gas, nuclear, right? Right. And I don't, there's no real way around it. I was just in Norway, and in Norway, they say climate, 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 and then they say, but we need to make sure the oil money keeps coming because it's really great being so rich. And then they say, oh, it's ridiculous to think about nuclear because that's just scary. And then Norway helps push EU to include natural gas as a clean fuel. It's kind of a, it doesn't really match our... Our, our expectation of Norwegians, and I, I don't think Norwegians themselves understand that. I think that's more of an elite thing, like the ambassadors and the, right. and the heads of state and the oil ministers and the climate ministers. They know that. But our goal should be to show that if you can't figure out how to solve this paradox, wanting to lower energy prices by producing more, but also not wanting to produce more because you care about the climate, that's going to squeeze right. sensible people back towards nuclear and there's where we'll make a happy home for them. So, I mean, to try and get in the heads of, um, you know, the, the, say the Belgian greens, for instance, or, you know, so much of the, uh, environmental movement, um, in terms of the argument that I see and the energy modeling that I see, um, it has to do with this idea that yes, we've got to burn natural gas for now as we build more and more renewables, you know, the capacity factor of that gas infrastructure is going to go down, down, down. And maybe eventually we can convert all of that gas infrastructure into uh, hydrogen, for instance, once we built enough renewables to, you know, <laughs> mostly replace things when the weather's uh, working and then to divert it to hydrolysis and, uh, and create hydrogen and, and use that infrastructure. Is that like just trying to get in their heads and understand um, and be empathetic? Is that is no. that the thought process? Yeah, it, maybe, but they don't care about the uh, all that other stuff like future decarb, all that. It's just whatever. The immediate goal is to kill nuclear. 
and they want to get it done before their own young greens convert entirely to nuclear. A lot of green parties around Europe are 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 have youth movements that are turning pro nuclear. Um, so the the actual greens in power are just trying to trash their country's energy system to force them to fossil fuels away from nuclear before getting kicked out of office or losing election. They, it's, it's not about the long term. It's not about whether you're going to get hydrogen. All that is just so much conference bullshit. Hydrogen is a dangerous gas to handle, dangerous gas to use. It is crazy. It is wild. It makes natural gas look easy. And natural gas blows up and kills people in their homes. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen's bad news. You're, you, it may work, and certainly it's a great thing to produce with nuclear power because you just power up a nuclear reactor and make hydrogen all year round. Like natural gas wells make natural gas year round. It matches the it matches the rhythm and logic of industrial production to make hydrogen with nuclear. But um, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna green hydrogen. I know I'm, I have friends in Australia who are convinced that green hydrogen is totally gonna come. I'll believe it when I see it. Like they'll believe SMRs when they see it. Uh, it's just. Eh, is bad economics to only sometimes make hydrogen, right? That's yeah. I mean, to to get though into the um, into the engineering, um, is it feasible to to transition that natural gas infrastructure into hydrogen infrastructure? I know hydrogen it's sneaky; it, it's the smallest atom. It it tends to leak. It embrittles things. Um, you know, Greenpeace. Uh, it's not it's Greenpeace Energy, which is. Uh, Associated, but not entirely owned, I think, by Greenpeace. Um, in Germany, they're, they're, we did a show on this. They're selling uh, pro wind gas and pro wind gas vegan plus, where their plan is to blend uh, larger and larger amounts of green hydrogen into Russian gas, uh, make some money off it, and and that's that's the transition model. Again, I'm just trying to be charitable, and I think it's useful to understand at least the the thinking and the logic behind um, those who. I think you and I are in opposition to, but from that perspective, is is it feasible to to turn that from an engineering perspective to turn that uh, gas infrastructure into hydrogen infrastructure? Different pipelines are going to have different amounts they can they can transition. I've heard different experts I I respect give different numbers. One of the one of the numbers we keep seeing is something like ten to fifteen percent of. Uh, a pipeline, a modern natural gas pipeline could be hydrogen without basically rebuilding the system. So there you go. 10 to 15 percent of this hugely expanded natural gas that we're getting Europe entirely addicted to um, could maybe be hydrogen. Otherwise, you'd have to build more. Or maybe maybe the idea is that you you produce it and then consume it for electricity production right there at on site, um, in which case you wouldn't you would just need the electricity pipelines transmission and not the hydrogen pipelines. But the closer mm -hmm. you get to the final consumer, the less hydrogen makes sense and the more dangerous it is. So like hydrogen cars, mm, no. So hydrogen airplanes, uh, it's just not a it's just not a friendly gas. Chris, it's just mm -hmm. not a friendly gas. It's not good to use, it's not good to transport. It's it's just it's uh, bad news. So you'd want to keep it in very large industrial operations, maybe for steel, maybe for again making power out of right there on site with uh, combustion turbines optimized to use hydrogen. So that you should mm -hmm. think in terms of big centralized production that the greens hate, just aesthetically, right. and not the tiny localized production that greens like aesthetically. So if there is a future for hydrogen, it's going to go against almost everything that the greens typically stand for. But then again, so too do the greens go against almost everything the greens stand for in Europe. So probably won't stop them. So to shift gears a little bit, I think a big question and, and the fracking revolution certainly put off this idea of peak oil, I don't know for how long, decades, maybe centuries. Um, but there's that question of how much do we have left? And from what I understand, fracking means that you're mining the source rock. There's no more hydrocarbons after you've, you've liberated that. You know, there's not any more gas hiding out um, once, you've, once you've broken up the source rock. It, it, what what's what are the estimates around you know how much natural gas we have left? We're obviously building this house of cards in terms of relying on natural gas infrastructure, where there's that issue of volatility, um, that diversion to from heating uh, to electricity, for instance. But in terms of you know this investment, um, how, how much longer do we have uh, for natural gas? Is that is that a you know the, obviously. When you think something's running out, it incentivizes exploration. You keep looking, you find more. It's a very dangerous uh, uh, prediction to make. But what's what's the Mark Nelson outlook on this? It is a moving target based 
on the price of natural gas. The higher the price of natural gas, the more worthwhile it is to explore different sources. Sometimes you find titanic new fields all at once, right? Yeah. Sometimes you find new methods, which opens up old fields all at once. The truth is, if that gas is shipping around the world for $20 a million BTU and people are buying it at that price, then there's going to be a lot more gas and trying to put a number on it, decades, centuries or whatever, it's just, there's enough. Right. At $140 per megawatt hour in a combined cycle plant, there's enough natural gas. And with with our financial with our financial system and you know major um, sources of capital like BlackRock, um, you know forbidding investment in uh, in fossil fuel infrastructure, it seems like it's going to be um, these nationalized companies like Gazprom that are going to be laughing all the way to the bank and and making those investments. Yes. So I mean, this but is one complication. One complication. Here's where it gets really weird. That cash that those trillions that, that that the big asset managers have are trillions that are units of debt you su suppose or value currency based on a cheap energy world in an expensive energy world whatever that money whatever those holdings are if they're not energy they're not worth so much relative speaking let me find a different way to put this at 140 dollars a megawatt hour natural gas in a, in a power plant, a lot of humans, a lot of human society just isn't worth it in the dollar value. Mm -hmm. A lot of activities, a lot of long-term thinking, long-term plans aren't worth it because now you've got to pay for the very motive force that makes it go. In a world where the energy is scarce and expensive, all these other activities that look like they look like the economy to us shrink in importance, shrink in scale, shrink in necessity, and you start becoming meaner, leaner. You're the hunter who has to get a lion, who has to scare off a lion and kill a gazelle, or you don't eat. That's the sort of thinking that comes in when energy prices are high. It leads us to two paths. The way I see it, one is a path where. There's a bifurcation. The countries that are rich enough and serious enough and ruthless enough to secure their energy supplies at high price are going to keep securing it and are going to close their borders and close their minds towards the outside world, including on climate change. Those countries that are not quite developed or not quite breaking through and have expensive energy already, like Nigeria is a country of 50, 60 million little private generators. It's like a proto-California, <laughs> you know, California <laughs> yeah. uh, getting all their generators and failing their grid. Anyway, they, uh, energy prices are very high there and all sorts of societal group actions that would just turn Nigeria into a, you know, a Malaysia, for example, to put, to put an example out there. Those aren't going to be happening if energy is really expensive. But there's another path. Call it the France path where you're staring down a future where all you can see as far as the, as the time horizon goes is expensive, painful energy. And you decide yeah. that's just simply unacceptable. You do not accept the cards that you draw. And in France, the cards, what cards did they draw? They don't have colonies that are rich enough in oil and gas that they were able to keep a hold of after World War II. They don't have the colonial play. Then they don't have much coal. Then they don't have much gas and they don't have much oil. They don't, France didn't get any North Sea. They were out of options. And if France wanted to be great from the perspective of the oil crises of the early 70s, they had to go with what provided something as good as fossil fuels, but without the fossil fuels, and that was nuclear. Mm -hmm. And it may be that expensive gas is what's required to reverse these awful, awful suicidal nuclear phase outs over the next three years in Europe, even in California, California is doing the same thing. California is like, wait, 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 we can be a failed state too. And that's why they're shutting down Diablo. If we can reverse those and these high gas prices riding through a long, ugly winter help do that. I don't want anyone to suffer, but that's baked in at this point. There will be suffering. The question is, right. what will it do to decision makers? We might get a little bit more like France, and a little bit less like the uh, barbarity, like falling apart. I, th I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, with these high prices combined with the uh, the, the carbon pricing as well, um, you know, I think 
right wing populist anti climate yellow vest style protests are, are quite likely and that can kind of take us in two directions one is to say you know to hell with these climate measures we want cheap energy um burn whatever you want um and the other option is to is to go nuclear it seems to be as as stark as that um you know it seems like most of the nuclear um, renaissance uh historically has had to do you know either with being a first adopter of the technology um but but also with really expensive fossil fuel prices that's that's what drove it in france and that's i think what drove it in uh japan or korea and we haven't even talked about price spikes in natural gas in in uh in asia for instance but you know if you're having to to ship in fossil fuels because you don't have them obviously you're a victim of that and i mean that was my conversation with mark kuangho in uh, in philippines is just the extreme price of imported fossil fuels so just maybe in closing um are we are we locked into higher natural gas prices going forward, given what we've described in terms of some of the characteristics of the fuel and, and the financing in terms of the way that um, climate change is, is affecting uh, financing? Um, what do you think? Is this is this just a, a scarcity? Is it a geopolitics? Is it a climate politics? Is it the characteristics of the fuel? Are, are we are we locked into this or could gas get cheap again and, and things will sort of carry on uh, as they've been for the last 10 or 15 years? What the fracking boom should tell anyone is that your expectations can always be dashed. Like there's always something out there that could change everything. A lot of observers I've seen that themselves take that view and take a long view seem to think that we're entering a period of structurally expensive natural gas. That fracking boom cost Wall Street hundreds of billions like it didn't they they made too much gas all at once it wasn't coordinated production under one oil czar gas czar like in other countries right. USA is the only country with uh private ownership of mineral rights and and people pumped as much as they could well that was a very new and expensive lesson for a lot of investors unless they're willing to plunge back into something like that collective madness of ultra cheap production where you can't cover your your fracking costs shall we say right Right. Then I think we may enter an era when, you know, the price hits four dollars at Henry Hub and just stays up there. Now, I'm not going to be some big dork and say, yeah, it's expensive forever, because in which case, be my guest, Chris, we can fund our all of our nuclear activities by just uh, making bets on the gas market and betting that it's not going to get cheap again. And anyway, I'm not I'm not going to be putting my money into gas. I'm not going to get involved in that. So I'm not going to predict that it's. Is going to stay a certain way. What I do think nuclear advocates could point out is that the current ultra high wholesale prices, the current ultra high natural gas prices, prove that ultra high gas and ultra high electricity prices can occur. They can occur. They mm -hmm. are occurring, so they can occur. And that the only way to make money off of the suckers who don't build nuclear is to have your own nuclear and not need to burn natural gas, whether you produce it or not. I think I think that natural gas has proven it can be expensive. It has proven it can be in short supply. And that's enough. That's enough to fight on. All right. Mark, I think we'll have to leave it there. I mean, I could uh, we could definitely do a second episode on this. It's been uh, very, very interesting. I have a lot more questions, but I think for uh, for the benefit of the viewers and keeping things around an hour, we'll have to have to cut it off here. Um, any any closing back from Europe? I'll know. More. That sounds good. And any closing thoughts for us at all? Or yeah, I think that people need to give a lot more respect to natural gas. It works. And when it doesn't work, you realize that our society's built on it. That's what Texas taught us. All the people who back wind and solar, their products went to shit. Okay? It went to absolute shit. Then, when natural gas wasn't as reliable as we've come to expect, that's when the pain really started. The mm -hmm. truth is, nobody ever ever expects to count on or rely on wind and solar, especially not elites, especially not the people flying in private jets to climate change conferences, Chris. No one expects to ever be limited by, by wind and sun, right? So it's natural gas that we rely on. I say respect natural gas, don't depend on it. Respect it enough to know that it can turn against you and that the only, the only way to handle it is to just not be reliant on it while appreciating that until we are not reliant on it, it keeps us alive. All right. 
thanks for those closing thoughts, Mark. Um, enjoy your travels, uh, Germany and Belgium. I know there's a great big stand up event happening. I don't, in Belgium. I I don't think I these are the too. enjoying type of travels, Chris. You know why we're. I know. I know. I know. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll get a report back either from you or someone else. Um, the Belgium event in, in particular is huge. If you're in Europe, I know there's a lot of people that are, that are heading out that way. September 11th, Brussels, I believeve. Um, it's, uh, you've, you've called it the Stalingrad, uh, for nuclear <laughs> and for this, for this bizarre energy transition, uh, in the midst of, of climate concern really towards, towards natural gas. It's, you can't make this stuff up in terms of the Green Party. Uh, again, as you've described in the show, uh, appealing for the financial authorities to, uh, to help them, you know, transition rapidly out of nuclear into gas. Anyway, we, we could go on and on, but we'll leave it here, Mark. Thanks again for coming on. Uh, we'll talk Always again a soon. pleasure, Chris. Bye.